I mentioned this a little earlier is that um, I'm in the midst of wedding season. It's one, what we do in the summer, right? It seems to offer us the opportunity to, to gather and celebrate um, weddings. And my family is preparing to celebrate the wedding of my nephew. He's 26, um, and I've known him his entire life. I was at the hospital when he was born, and he is one of my favorite people. Um, and so last night, I was at a shower for his fiance. And um, so as most wedding showers go, um, there were games. I loathe the games, but I'm also very competitive. So I was determined that I was gonna win, and one of the games is, you know, um, is it her or him? And there's like usually a list of things, like who said I love you first, who's better driver, who spends all the money, all these things. And so I'm like, I know this kid. I've known this kid his entire life. I'm gonna get most of these right. Out of the 10 questions, I got two right. I was so bummed, and I'm sitting there going, I know this kid. I know who Zach is. And then I realized, like, I know him as his aunt. And the person, by the way, who got most of the answers right was a woman who is um, the sister-in-law to the fiance. I'm like, you haven't even been around that long. How do you know the answers to this? Are you cheating? And <laughs> I realized, though, like for this context, she knows the answers better than I did. He know, she knows the relationship better than I do. And it was just an interesting thing for me to sit there and kind of wrestle with, like, do I even know this kid? And by the way, he's a full-grown adult. He has an adult job. He's bought a house. He's not a kid, but he is. He's still the giant-headed baby I held in my arms. And I was thinking about this, and I'm like, no, I know Zach. I know his character. I don't know everything about him, but I always get to learn new things about him in life. And some of the things last night were new to me, and it didn't change his character, but it changed a little bit of my perception of him, my experience with him at times. But it wasn't like he was changing. It was just my understanding of him was changing a bit evolving and growing. And I've been thinking about that ever since last night and thinking about this passage that we are in right now today. We are in 1 John, and John is writing letters to um, the faith communities around the area, and he is trying to address misconceptions, misperceptions, false information, and particularly as it regards to Jesus. And I was thinking about this in particular, about this question I have been wrestling with as we kind of dug into this letter, in particular in 1 John. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you, in particular? That's a, a question sometimes I ask people because it gives me an understanding of not only how they view God, but how they view themselves. And it is a fundamental question that does lie at the core of our faith. And in today's culture, there is a notion that Jesus can be whoever we want him to be. You know, we can shape him by our personal preferences, our ideas. We can pick and choose the things we like or we don't like. And much of this, at times, comes from kind of media, art, um, movies in particular. And um, as I was thinking about this this week, um, realizing where we're going with this, um, I started to dig into some of these images. And um, Rox, can you do me a favor and hop to Buddy G Jesus on the slides for me? <laughs> so, I, and I realized this, I wanna dig into these images first before we get into our text. And um, yes, this is one of my favorite images and most loathed movies. Because this comes from the movie Dogma by Kevin Smith. And it's not awful, but it's just people like, especially when I was in youth ministry, kids would come to me and say, I saw this movie Dogma. And I'm like, mm-hmm. And they're like, it's so, all this stuff. And I'm like, mm, that's Kevin Smith's imagination, which is just what it is. Like, 
don't, but this idea of buddy Jesus, he's your buddy. Well, then this was even more exciting to me in youth ministry is we took some students to see the Passion of the Christ. Okay, I'm dating myself for youth ministry, but we took them to see the Passion of the Christ. And it would be weeks later that I would overhear one of um, the young girls talking about the hot Jesus. And I was like, the hot Jesus. And part of me wanted to be offended, and then I'm like, no, it's the actor is a very attractive man. Jim Caviezel is very attractive. And then I started to kind of look at more pictures and images from movies of Jesus. Even the guy who played Jesus Christ Superstar in, uh, is, is very attractive. Like, they're all attractive. And then we have some of the, the art pieces that come to us. And a lot of times people are imagining Jesus as they want him to be. And in some ways that's kind of good because it's like we should be related, relating to Jesus in some ways. But at the same time, like, Mm, it, it can go down this slippery slope for us. And, you know, even, even The Chosen, which I've not seen, seen, but a lot of people have spoken very highly of, I think it's being well done, is still an artist's interpretation. And that can be really good for us at times because it gives us different perspectives. But at the same time, we have to remind ourselves that this, much like that movie, Dogma, is not scripture. It's somebody's imagination playing out a story and so for me thinking about this this is actually images that um, artists have reconstructed in cooperation with anthropologists looking at kind of skeletons from the first century of people who lived in um, ancient Israel and so these guys look very different than these guys a little bit more melanin in the skin, a little darker features. And I'm not saying that, you know, we have to like, oh, this has to be our Jesus. But I want us to kind of break away from any Jesus that we cling to that is man-made. Even this one. Because these man-made Jesuses, you know, whether it's little baby Jesus that you see and, you know, crib to this one painting that has been, in, I think, in millions of older churches forever. Um, I forget the artist's name that did this, but it's everywhere. He's very, very, very uh, bland <laughs> as a Jesus, I think, in some ways. But I want us to think about that. Who is the Jesus that we know? Who is Jesus to us? And as individuals, as we seek the truth about Jesus, I think we have to explore who Jesus truly revealed himself to be, rather than conforming him to our liking, even if it is this attractive. And thinking about even our singular experiences of God, which are powerful and wonderful and moving, they are not total. And they are not universal because they are ours. And I think about this, especially in context of one of my um, favorite authors um, is Anne Lamont. And I think I put my slides all out of order. So you're going to have to bear with me today. So this is Anne Lamont. And she is um, an author. She's a recovering alcoholic and an addict. And she has come to faith in her recovery. And she says this. And I think this is something for us to keep in mind. You can safely assume you've created God in your own image. And I think that's sometimes what we do. We've created God in our own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. You know, when God hates all the people you do, you might want to step back and go, that may not be the real Jesus. So, thinking about this and thinking about how we do need to understand who Jesus is. In light of our experiences, we also need to have humility and curiosity to allow ourselves to know him better. Just like I'm learning more about my nephew in this experience of, actually, I'm the officiant for his wedding, and so I'm learning different sides of him. It, he's not changing. He's just revealing more of himself to me, and I think that is so true of God and Jesus. When we take the time to be humble 
and say, I don't know everything, and to be curious and say, what don't I know? And to seek to know it. And I want us to dig into this biblical understanding of Jesus a little bit more. And so, um, Rox, I'm going to ask you to help me again and jump back to the first verse um, rather than me kind of like punch around here in the dark. I can only go backwards and forwards. She can go in all different directions. It's pretty cool. Um, so really, they have the power back there. Um, but digging into our biblical passage today, we are in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. I'm going to read this for us today. But the thing is that the challenges that John is addressing here that these early Christian communities faced, you know, 2,000 years ago, are about false teachings that are really distorting how they understand God and Jesus. So let me read this for us. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But if you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit, and all of you know the truth, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Denying the Father and the Son, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son also the Father has also the Father. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has been taught to you, remain in him. And so I'm kind of thinking about Annie's comment here and what we know about Jesus, what we don't, and that this community that we're digging into, you know, 2,000 years ago, is understanding the significance of Jesus' role in our lives. Who is he? And how his gospel teaches us who he is and God's kingdom and what that plan is for us. And so as we kind of wonder about who Jesus truly is, with curiosity and humility, we have to kind of push back that Jesus can be whoever we want him to be. Because he's not whoever we want him to be. He's not Play-Doh that we can shape in whatever version we want by our personal preferences or our, even our personal agendas at times. He's revealed himself in a very specific way real way. And it's essential for us to understand who the true Jesus is. Because it defines who we are. So who is Jesus to you? You may have never even thought about this. But the question is crucial. And to understand it fully, we need to answer a more fundamental question is, who is Jesus? Not who is Jesus to you, not who is Jesus to me, but who is Jesus? Because we don't have the, you know, when we don't have the answer to something, this is what I've really been wrestling with a lot lately, is when we don't have the answer to something, we like to write a story to fill in the gaps. You know, when we don't understand why somebody treated us the way that they did, we start to write a story for them. Oh, they were rude to me or I thought they were rude to me because they don't like me. Or they could be having a bad day, they could have an ingestion. Um, who knows? They could have just gotten bad news. You may not even be somebody they're even thinking about whether they like you or not. But we fill in the gaps to explain what we don't understand. And so thinking about this has been interesting to me that we try to fill in the gaps. And where we allow others to fill in those gaps for us. And this is where I think conspiracy theories come from. And it's not simply because people are simple-minded or because they're mentally ill, 
But I think we have sometimes an attraction to conspiracy theories because we're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense to us in the moment. We have a need to understand because when we understand, we feel like we're in control and we feel like we're safe in our environment. You think about those places, and we've experienced a lot of uncertainty in the last few years of our lives, right? Like, what's this going to look like? Are our kids going to be back in school? Are we going to go back into the office? Like, that uncertainty, we start to write in because we're not certain, and we start to create all sorts of theories about what's going on. We need to have that understanding and feel safe in the moment because I think there are th critical questions that we always are asking, whether they're big picture questions or small ones, and that is, why am I here? What does it mean? What happens next? Why am I here? What does it mean? What happens next? A friend posted those three questions this week, and I have been wrestling with them because I think when we don't have the answers to them, we make stuff up or we look for things that confirm what we think should be happening. And so there's really nothing new under the sun, by the way, because this is what's going on in the communities that John is writing to. You know, 2,000 years ago, people were rejecting the teachings of the church because of false teachers teachers who were coming in and kind of filling in the gaps where people really didn't fully understand or maybe had, you know, had a better experience of things. And people were leaving those communities because they were denying something essential about Jesus. These false teachers were teaching that he wasn't the Son of God, that he wasn't the Christ. And because of those gaps and that misinformation, People were confused. And it's so interesting to me because most likely we're going to grab on to another theory or an understanding or a story, not always because it makes the most sense, but because of social relationships, because of the relationships we have, and because these teachers had relationships with people in the community. People were willing to believe them and follow them. And when they denied critical aspects of Jesus' identity, such as his divine nature and his role as Messiah, it really rocked the community. And it leads to this confusion and a huge amount of discouragement among the believers because they're at war with each other about their ideology, about their faith. Like, what do you really believe? Who is Jesus? So they're trying to make Jesus into who they think he should be. And we see this a lot. And as we delve into this biblical text, we hear John talking about the last hour. And this can sometimes lead us down some even more big and wondrous conspiracy theories in our faith. But the last hour is, is really language that's referring to the time period between Christ's first and second coming. So Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, and then the Jesus that we know who is coming again, but has not yet. So this, this time in between is simply the last hour. And no one knows how long it is. Only God does. Though people love to kind of look for all that stuff. There's lots of things up there. People love to take revelation and look for all the signs. But we're told again and again in Scripture, only God knows. So I don't think you're going to figure out the puzzle. You're not smarter than God. I'm sorry. I hate to say that to you, but you're not. So just let it be and just get behind the last hour. It's the time we're in. And it's the last hour because it is the final chapter of God's redemptive plan. That's simply the language that they have applied to it. Like, this is the final chapter. It's just a really long chapter, by the way, when we think about things. So thinking about this and thinking about this time period that John is writing about is that this idea, like, God's plan matters. God's plan matters because we are in this final chapter. And the Apostle John, who is writing this letter, is warning them about the existence of what are called antichrists. And we can go down an even further rabbit trail of conspiracy theories all day with the idea of an antichrist, but I want to unpack it for us very quickly and briefly, because really an antichrist is really just denying the essential truths about Jesus that cause ultimately confusion and disillusionment in the community. 
And the word that John is using here is um, antichristos in the Greek. So anti, we all know what anti means. Um, and so going from that, you know, this term antichrist is really only found in First and Second John. It's only found in these letters of John. And it really is about people who are trying to substitute themselves in Christ's place. They're trying to put themselves there in that leadership position, that position of authority. And the interesting thing is anti can not only mean against or opposite, but also in place of, like a substitute, you know, kind of like a substitute teacher in a way, thinking about it. And so thinking about what is going on here in this situation. So antichrist, so there are people in the community who are one plural. There's many of them. So it's not some singular person. And it's describing people, not demons or Satan or this. The Antichrist is merely people who step into the place of Christ and deliver false information. And the individuals who are seeking, many times, I think, to substitute themselves in Christ's place. And, you know, there's other terms that are used throughout Scripture, even ones that Jesus warns us about with false Christ, which is pseudo, not anti here, but pseudo Christos. And it's only found in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel. And it's Jesus himself who's warning his followers. Watch out for these false prophets, these pseudo-Christos. And it's not something to get all wrapped up into, but I wanted to unpack it for us because it can be in a confusing place and it can lead us in some of those directions of misdirection and confusion. And a false Christ were really just false prophets, people who were often perform signs and wonders and look really good but have bad information and so Jesus is warning people about that and now John is warning people about folks who are trying to stand in Christ's place and tell them misinformation about Jesus himself so the folks that John is primarily talking about are these antichrists people who someone who is in opposition to Jesus someone who actually seeks to take his place in many ways of having the truth, the gospel for folks, and doing it through deception. And I think that's the nature of evil. The nature of evil is to deceive us. Even going back to the very first, you know, book of the Bible in Genesis, the serpent's tactic was deception, misdirection. Deception is how evil works in this world. It deceives people, leading them away from the truth, often confusing the truth for people. And as Kevin talked about in the last few weeks, that light and darkness, which are heavy images in our scripture here, in this whole book, you know, 1 John, that darkness is really the absence of God. And so when we think about what it is to embrace a distorted God, use that term loosely, that's created by false teaching, then we do not have God. We have a false truth that calls itself God. And it can feel like, you know, this is really shaky ground at times for us. So who is Jesus? What is the biblical reality? Because that's what we have to go back to, is scripture a lot of times to measure against what is really good. Who has Jesus revealed himself to be? He's revealed himself in his word scripture. So thinking about what we've been warned about, what John is trying to correct in these communities about false teachings, it's vital even today, 2,000 years later, for us to be able to discern between truth and the multitude of ideas in the world. You know, you can kind of laugh at a bunch of teenagers taking a movie as fact and scripture and faith, you know, teaching but we do it a lot we allow a lot of different ideas to come into our faith that sometimes are just you know a placebo it doesn't have an effect on us but a lot of times it can lead us into wrong directions if we don't correct it if we don't measure it against the standard and the truth that if we don't allow if we don't try to correct the distortion the distortion is going to continue to work its way through all of our theology And that can jeopardize our relationship with God because we then really don't know who God is. Jesus himself taught that he is the only way to the Father. 
And John emphasized that denying the Son here means rejecting the Father as well. And we can't pick and choose what we like about Jesus and what we don't like about Jesus. We kind of have to see him as he is. Fully God, fully man. And in the midst of the deception of this world, the noise of it all, the confusion of it all, the amazing thing is that Jesus has not left us helpless. See, for us, we not only have scripture, but we have the Holy Spirit who dwells within. The Holy Spirit empowers us to discern the truth and live according to God's word and who Jesus really is. And this is the beauty that even within scripture, it teaches us that the spirit testifies to the truth about Jesus. That when we don't understand, we can seek guidance from God himself in guiding us in understanding and living out the gospel. And so despite sometimes those doubts, those struggles that we face in this life, that holding on to, you know, the true Jesus is worth the fight but it is a fight we have to push back we have to measure things against what we understand we have to constantly who is jesus to me because i think sometimes when we understand that then we can start to see oh i've kind of made a little play-doh jesus here (laughs) and i need to go back to who is jesus to truly understand and this is the beautiful thing about the gift of the spirit is that, and John speaks to this, is this idea of charism. And it's the gift of the Spirit. And it's the word that is used in this passage for anointing. And a lot of times we think of this in Scripture as spiritual gifts. You know, special abilities um, such as teaching or wisdom or the gift of mercy and compassion with people that it just seems to be so supernatural in some people when you see it. That's what this word is used in other places, but John here is using to talk about this favor, this gift given by God to us of the very Spirit itself. The power to know. And it's a good gift that flows from God, from God's very love to us. And so when we feel confused, when we feel like, I don't really even know what is right here, We can lean into this. We can lean into the Spirit to guide us, to give us this charism and know. And again, it is sometimes a battle, but it's worth it. It's a wrestling. It's it's asking hard questions and looking for the answers, not simply the easy ones that we can look in Wikipedia, but actually digging in having conversations, yes, with each other, but also conversations with the Spirit and with Scripture itself at times so that we can discern what is the truth in this world. Who really is Jesus? And God has given us that. He has given us his Spirit and he has given us his Word. So we already have these tools at our hand. It's just sometimes a little overwhelming to go, how do I use them? How do I do this? And how do I stay grounded in the truth? How do I abide in Jesus' word and the Holy Spirit? How, how do you do that? Like, it sounds good, but mechanically, practically, how do I do this? How can I do this to kind of resist the allure of false teachings? How can I use it to help go, okay, that's clearly, you know, a little misguided or that's distorted, It is really simple, but it's a fight because it's not always easy because it goes against what we often want to do. We want things to often be easy and and complicated more than simple, right? Like we, we like the idea that things would be simple, but we really want it to be more complicated because then it feels like it's worth it. But it really is simple. It is reading scripture. And when you're confused about what to do, go back to the Gospels. Read them through. And the thing is, it's the more that you read them, the more that they will become clear. 
and not just reading them, but inviting God's Spirit to guide you in that reading. And it can be as simple as a passage, as, as saying, God, help me. <laughs> like, that is one of the simplest prayers ever, and I don't know that we use it enough. We feel like we need more, bigger words, better words, because that will get it done. No. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss it all you want. Help me, God, to understand. Help me, God. Make it as simple and as easy as that. Help me to understand this. Help me to know what to do in this situation. And lean into that. And when something doesn't feel right, that may be the Spirit speaking to you in that. It could be indigestion. It could be. But when it keeps happening, investigate. This is the assurance we have in this world. It's based on an abiding faith. An abiding faith is about living in to faith with God, living everyday faith with God. And that takes some discipline and some work. And I always recommend you start small. So it may be that simple prayer that you start with every day, help me, God. Help me. You may just read a few verses a day. You may just read a chapter a day, whatever it is. But keep it simple. Keep it manageable so that even if it's like, I got five minutes, you can do it. Because it's better to put in five minutes than none at all. Because if you make it a big, complicated thing, like, oh, I got to sit down for two hours, I got to, you know, write out all my prayers, and I got to read through this whole, you know, book of Isaiah, and no. Make it simple so that you can do it because it's in the repetition and the everyday action that relationships are built. And that's what this is all about. It's that everyday connection. And it will grow. And it's in that abiding faith that we find assurance. Assurance of who God is. Assurance of who we are. That even when things are uncertain, we are assured that God is with us. Not this distorted vision of our preferences, but we are assured that Jesus is with us. So, so who is Jesus to you? Are you willing to surrender to the true Jesus as revealed in the scriptures? Are you in a place that you feel like I can trust him? And if you're not, okay baby steps take those moments to say I I don't know God help me but I want us to embrace the real Jesus not the one that media depicts not the one that you know art depicts as beautiful as those images can be at times as as inspiring as meditative as they can be for us but who is the real Jesus Digging into scripture and digging into relationship with the Holy Spirit. Experiencing that abundant life that he has for us now and into the future and into eternity. Understanding who Jesus is matters. And it goes beyond personal preference and cultural interpretations. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Empower you to hold on to the gospel. See, when we abide in Jesus, we we have that hope, that anticipation of the fulfillment of our faith, a life eternal with him. I want us to be confident in the truth of who Jesus is because when everything else falls apart, he is true. And so, friends, we need to seek him every day, approaching him with an open head and heart, being humble and curious. So when things are confusing, and even when they're not, so when things are confusing, yes, but every day, even when the world makes sense, even when everything seems to be going your way, In both of those situations, when it's confusing and when it is not, 
Seek Jesus. Seek him through his word. Seek him through prayer. Seek God in asking for the very presence of the Holy Spirit. Reread those Gospels. Get to know Jesus so well. Ask for God's wisdom and insight to guide you. Ask for him to give you the strength, the courage to embrace the real Jesus, the one who has been revealed in the gospel, granting us the assurance of eternal loving life with God. Trust in Jesus. Trust in who he truly is, the one who offers us this abundant life that is beyond our wildest dreams. Allow me to pray for us as we prepare for communion today. Gracious Lord, give us the courage and the strength to dig in to who you are. Give us the humility to know that we don't have all the answers, but the curiosity to seek them. Give us wisdom and insight into who you are so that we can better know ourselves, to better have assurance in this life even when everything is so uncertain. Reveal more of yourself to us every day so that we know and love you better. Guide us, God. Help us. Help us to know and trust you better every day. We ask this in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.